Uh, hello, my name is Jaya, and on behalf of my co-organizer, Vizehi, we'd like to welcome you all to the 2012 Advantes Forum. It's great to see you here. Uh, and like you all, Vadehi and I are very excited to hear from this incredible panel we have. Uh, and they've come from all across the country to be here today. Uh, Dallas, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, from one of our own Dartmouth institutes. So please help me uh, welcome them to Dartmouth. <laughs> I'd like to start with a few words about, uh, about this forum. Uh, it's in its second year, and it's a student-run, annually held event. And we originally conceived it to bring leading voices in the field to Dartmouth and to engage them in a conversation about uh, some of the most important issues we're facing right now. Uh, and our aim with this discussion is not to provide clear-cut solutions to things like healthcare, because I mean, it's not possible to even really understand these issues in one two hour sitting, although we'll try. Uh, so our hope is that through this shared experience tonight, uh, we'll spark a sustained dialogue within the Dartmouth community and a desire to uh, engage in a thoughtful way. So the title of this year's forum is Too Many Holes or Not Enough Net. This is a pretty provocative question is meant to challenge us to reconcile practice and theory as we work towards a more sustainable medical safety net. Throughout this forum, we hope to facilitate a conversation about existing and proposed reforms and how they affect the overall sustainability of the American healthcare system. The topic is both timely with the ongoing Supreme Court hearings on the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and fitting given Dartmouth's standing as a longtime leader in healthcare delivery research. We are joined tonight by three distinguished panelists. Each has worked passionately and contributed significantly to the topics at hand. We're looking forward to an exciting dialogue. And we challenge each panelist to not only discuss individual viewpoints, but to find areas of agreement. And our moderator, Dr. Ellen Mira, will push them to do just that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mira of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. Good afternoon. U.S. healthcare faces three closely linked challenges in 2012, as it has for many years cost, quality, and access. In 2010, the U.S. spent $2.4 trillion on healthcare, in other words, $8,400 per person in the U.S., or nearly 18% of GDP. This reflects growth in healthcare spending over time that has consistently exceeded the growth of wages for workers or other aspects of the economy. Despite the fact that we spend more than any other country, both in absolute terms and relative to GDP, outcomes in the US compare poorly with other wealthy countries who spend much less. And evidence suggests there's great room to improve the quality of care in the US. One influential study estimated that only about half of patients receive recommended care, even when they do access medical care. As private insurance coverage shrinks in the US, accessing health care in recent years has become even more difficult. Between 2000 and 2010, employer-sponsored coverage dwindled from 69% to 59% of non-elderly, non that is, persons under 65. The number of uninsured in this country is hovering at about 50 million, with great uncertainty about whether this figure will grow or shrink depending upon the Supreme Court ruling on the constitutionality of various aspects of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Regardless of the future of the Affordable Care Act, any reform to health care in the U.S. faces these same three challenges in U.S. health care. Skyrocketing costs, many gaps in quality of care, and uneven access to care. This panel will address the challenge of making healthcare more sustainable while examining whether and how existing and proposed reforms affect quality and access to care for the nation's most vulnerable populations. With these formidable challenges, it's my privilege today to introduce our three panel members, each of whom brings a very different perspective to these problems. In reverse alphabetical order, let me start with Dr. Patrice Harris, who is the Director of Health Services for Fulton County, Georgia, including Atlanta. 
Dr. Harris directs all county health services, including partnerships that deliver a wide range of public safety, behavioral health, and primary care treatment and prevention. As a practicing psychiatrist and former medical director for the Fulton County Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, she, perhaps more than any panel member, is intimately familiar with the obstacles experienced by the most vulnerable patients served by our healthcare system. Following many years of active participation in professional organizations, including serving on the board of the American Psychiatric Association and as a delegate to the American Medical Association, a member of the governing council of the AMA Women Physicians Congress, and other efforts too numerous to mention, uh, um, Dr. Harris was elected to serve on the AMA Board of Trustees. We are grateful to Dr. Harris for taking the time to travel from Georgia to be with us today. As part of her role on the AMA Board, Dr. Harris advocates strongly for legislation that would promote and against legislation that might threaten the stability of physician fees from large public payers of healthcare like Medicare. We'll return to that later. Our second panelist, Dr. John Goodman, a PhD economist, health policy commentator, and as his biography describes, widely known as the father of health savings accounts, brings an entirely different perspective. Dr. Goodman is president and CEO of the National Center for Policy Analysis, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization established in 1983. The goal of this organization is to develop and promote private, free market alternatives to government regulation and control. Dr. Goodman is also the Kelly Wright Fellow in Healthcare. The mission of the Wright Fellowship is to promote a more patient-centered, consumer-driven healthcare system. He's written numerous articles, authored 10 books, including Patient Power, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis. He's an active blogger and a frequent contributor to publications including the Wall Street Journal, Health Affairs, and many others. Based in Dallas, Texas, we're grateful that Dr. Goodman could travel to Hanover today. And on a note of particular interest here, Dr. Goodman has taught and done research at many uh, academic institutions, but including Dartmouth College. Um, and many of you know our final panelists very well, Dr. Elliot Fisher, who's the James W. Squires Professor of Medicine and Community and Family Medicine at Dartmouth Medical School. He wears many hats. He's also the Director for Population Health and Policy at the Dartmouth Institute, and he's co-director of the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare. His early research, as most people know, focused on exploring the causes of twofold differences in spending observed across U.S. regions and understanding the implications of these variations for health and health care. Those of you who have interacted with Elliot more recently know that he has been passionately involved in understanding and developing approaches to slowing the growth of healthcare spending while improving quality. He was one of the originators of the concept of accountable care organizations, and he's now leading with Mark McClellan, a joint Brookings Dartmouth program to advance ACOs through research, coordination of public and private initiatives, and the creation of a learning collaborative that includes pilot ACO sites across the US. He's also working with multiple stakeholders to accelerate the adoption and implementation of more robust measures of health outcomes, care experience, decision quality, and cost to support both practice improvement and performance measurement. So um, I welcome all of you. The way that we will proceed today is that the panelists agreed that they would like to, um, they would like to begin with 10 minutes of um, introduction, uh, basically introductory comments on these issues that are facing us. And so uh, we will do that at, at the end of that 30 minutes. I have a few questions specifically for the panelists, and we will leave about 30 minutes for audience question and answer at the end. Um, so we couldn't think of a more fair way to do it than alphabetical order and then reverse alphabetical order. So. <laughs> Oh. So, Elliot, would you mind starting? <laughs> Ellen, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all, uh, and I actually represent the Geisel School of Medicine at this particular moment. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> just ribbing Ellen. Um, it's, it is, doesn't trip off the tongue very easily. So, it's great to have you here. Let me just share a little bit about sort of what we've learned over the last few, you know, last few years and how I'm thinking about reform, and hopefully give you some principles that you can sort of use to test um, upcoming reforms. Keep in mind while we're doing this two kinds of patients. Think of 
you know, the healthy 64-year-old um, with acute back pain. That would be me. And so if I look like I'm grimacing at some point, um, it's probably because my back is going into spasm or something like that. No in insult to any of my friends here on the panel um, or to you all. Um, but very low per capita costs, acute problems occasionally, uh, and the kinds of choices that those people face are very different than the kinds of choices my second patient will face. Those healthier patients account for about 20% of U.S. healthcare spending. The other patient might be my mother, um, who was 88 when she died, and in the six months prior to her death, spent five of those months in multiple institutions, transferred back and forth, um, because each institution actually got a payment for having her be there only a certain amount of time and would make more money if they could get her to the next institution. So she experienced terribly coordinated care, um, no, no effective communication among the specialists who were taking care of her. So um, keep in mind that kind of patient as well as we think about the underlying problems in healthcare. So what we've learned over the last multiple years working with Jack Weinberg and many other folks here uh, is that you know, when you look at the variations in spending that we're, many of you will probably be familiar with, twofold differences in spending, the higher spending regions don't spend more money on the kind of effective care that Ellen mentioned, where we still only deliver it to half of the patients who should get it. Um, they don't do any more elective surgery. Um, they don't do any more of the things that we might choose to get if we were well informed. Um, all of the extra spending in the high spending regions is devoted to discretionary services like unnecessary stays in the hospital that my mother got to experience, um, extra visits to specialists, um, extra MRI or diagnostic tests. And what we learned was that more spending wasn't necessarily better. In fact, on average, it's about even. You spend 30% more in U.S. healthcare, you don't get better healthcare outcomes or quality um, from the patient's perspective. With a lot further research, with John Skinner, who's here, you know, other colleagues who I can't quite see through the lights, <laughs> um, who I know are here, you know, we really looked into the underlying causes of the terrible waste and uneven quality and poor coordination that we see in the United States healthcare system. I think the first thing um, is that we're not clear about the aims of what we're trying to achieve. Um, you can see many places around the country who are trying to treat patients as an opportunity to make money. Um, and others where what they really care about is providing the best care possible for their patients. So the lack of clarity in the aims, we need to remedy by having complete clarity about what we're trying to achieve. It is about a sustainable healthcare system. Better health, better care, lower cost for everybody. Those who are in need, those in the safety net, for everybody. So clear aims. By the way, the Affordable Care Act calls for a national quality strategy, which includes those three aims. So the Affordable Care Act actually sets, you know, addresses that first principle of clarity about what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the second problem, fundamentally, is inadequate information in unengaged patients. So if we, we have physicians don't have any idea how they're practicing right now compared to the doctor who's next to them in the next office. Um, patients actually have very limited information about the risks and benefits of the treatments they're receiving and are unable in the way we're operating healthcare right now to make wise choices about whether they want it or not, whether I should get another MRI um, in the, in facing my current back pain. If I don't have access to good information about that, about what that entails, or, uh, then I can't make wise choices. Um, we also have no information about the quality of providers or the quality of specific services. So the second principle that we have to test any reform against is does this provide better information for patients? Better information about what works and doesn't, and better information that would help them wisely engage in a decision about do I want this CT scan for my six-year-old where the radiation exposure might be substantial or might there be some other ways um, to meet that interest? Uh, and we need information to help providers improve. The Affordable Care Act does a remarkable job of investing substantially um, in coordinating performance measures. Um, Medicare is making a tremendous effort to figure out how to get better measures that can help clinicians improve their practices, that can help engage patients in, in making wise choices. The third underlying problem um, is that we've, we've been thinking badly about healthcare. We have a flawed conceptual model. We think that you produce health by face-to-face -face encounters with, between a, a doctor and a patient. When, when what we've learned from everywhere else in industry is that it takes systems to produce good results. 
Um, we have fragmented care because we have fragmented systems that don't talk to each other. So the third principle is how do we put together, how do we encourage the formation of organizations that can work together, where providers, physicians, nurses, hospitals, nursing homes can work together to effectively coordinate care, um, to provide the kind of continuous improvement of quality that we've seen work very well um, in quality improvement initiatives that have been adopted by industry. Interestingly enough, the Affordable Care Act includes a number of reforms targeted that, whether it's paying physicians and hospitals by a bundle, that is, pay them for a group of services like a hip fracture replacement, or this notion of accountable care organizations, which is a group of providers who come together voluntarily to work um, together to try to improve the performance of care, to try to coordinate care. That was work that was done by Julie Bynum, Dan Gottlieb, who I think I might have seen wandered in, um, myself and others here at Dartmouth to propose that idea. Um, it was, it, it's a major program under the, Medicare, under the Medicare program, and there are lots of pilots being carried out, including in the safety net. The fourth problem is flawed financial incentives um, for patients and for providers. So that if we have incentives that just reward doctors for cranking patients through the treadmill or running them through their CT scan, um, you will get more CT scans. You will get more visits to doctors. You will get more hospital stays because that's the way we pay hospitals. If patients have no understanding um, of the financial implications of their decisions, either to choose a health plan wisely or to choose a procedure wisely, if they're completely blind to that, they're going to be unengaged with the decisions we make. Now, so we have to figure out how to get those incentives aligned wisely for providers and for patients. Uh, I think that there's some, a lot of tweaks to that. I told you about the, you know, the healthy, well-insured, you know, the healthy, well-insured 64-year-old who's got plenty of money. You know, they pay doctors ridiculous salaries these days. Um, <laughs> You know, there should be some serious financial disincentives for me to get to, from avoiding getting too much care. Now, if I'm talking to one of my patients at the VA who has no money, um, we have to think very carefully about how we structure the financial incentives for that population so that they make wise choices. Um, so better incentives is the, is the fourth principle. The last one is, is a little more complicated, but, but this is an incredibly diverse country. You know, we have, we have Texas, we have Vermont, <laughs> we, have a, we have Georgia, and we have to acknowledge that complexity as we think about reforms. So single bullet, magic bullets are not going to solve our problem. It's going to come from emergent learning. And I will say that the investment in the Affordable Care Act for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which was given $20 billion to invest in pilot programs around how to improve um, health care where they're testing all sorts of creative things, um, new ways of paying physicians, new ways of paying nurses, new ways of paying community health practitioners, um, offers the opportunity to test new innovations, to evaluate them, and if they prove successful in certain contexts, to generalize those um, to the country as a whole. So let me, let me wrap up by telling, uh, giving an update on the status of accountable care organizations. It's really pretty remarkable. So, um, we were lucky to have, Mark, Dr. McClellan and I were lucky to have it included in the health care reform legislation. Uh, it was, there, there are several different flavors of it, but there is a national program called the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Um, there is a lot of excitement among uh, physicians and hospitals now about that. Uh, Mark and I are leading a learning network. We have uh, 100 organizations that are part of that. Um, it's, it's what we're observing is we've shifted from a head-to-head -head conflict between providers um, and payers about dickering over prices and how much to raise co-insurance rates. Um, very head-to-head -head conflicted negotiations to a real partnership model that's emerging. So what we see is private payers and delivery organizations working side by side um, to figure out what each of them can contribute to delivering better care and lower costs. They are figuring out how should we get the financial incentives to work for patients? How can we reward providers for working together well? So I think that that fifth principle that I'd encourage us to acknowledge is diversity. ACOs were intended to fit in diverse market contexts, diverse providers, and we're seeing those emerge. From Tucson, uh, where I visited two weeks ago, an ACO made up private, of a private sector ACO made up of private practice docs, um, a community hospital working with them, to Dartmouth-Hitchcock, which is a large integrated delivery system here. And so I think remembering those five principles, you know, keeping our aims clear, 
you know, are we providing better information to patients and providers? Thinking about whether we're fostering systems, getting the incentives right, and acknowledging complexity is a way that you can start to think about, how can I judge this reform that someone's talking to me about? So that would be my, my thoughts about an opening set of comments. Thank you very much. Dr. Goodman. Sure, I, I did what I was told, I turned this off. <laughs> but I want to point out to all of you that there are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. Uh, even the panhandler on the corner probably has a cell phone, but he probably doesn't have very good access to healthcare. Now, if something goes wrong with my cell phone, there are dozens of shops in Dallas, Texas that I can walk into without any appointment. I can get prompt service, high quality service for a reasonable price. There are even repair shops that will send people to my home to repair the cell phone. There's a chain uh, store uh, system called iHospital and their employees are called phone doctors. But if something goes wrong with me, with my body, did you know the average wait in the United States for a new patient to see a doctor is one week? Over in Boston, where we're told they have universal coverage, the average wait for a new patient to see a doctor is two months. Amazingly, one out of every five people who walks into an emergency room in the United States leaves without ever seeing a doctor, presumably because they get tired of waiting. Now, why is it that the market is so much kinder to our cell phones than it is to our bodies? I would argue that it's because this cell phone is bought and sold and repaired in a real market with real prices where entrepreneurs know that they can make millions of dollars if they can figure out ways to meet our needs. Whereas in healthcare, we have decade after decade after decade so suppressed the market that no one ever sees a real price for anything. No patient, no doctor, no employer, no employee. The single biggest mistake we have made in healthcare is the belief that patients should never pay money prices when they seek care. We have assumed wrongly that the best way to make healthcare accessible is to make sure that it's free at the time that it's delivered. Forgetting that if people don't pay with money, they're gonna pay with something else. In the United States, the primary way we pay for care is the same way they pay in Canada and Britain and all over Europe. We pay with time and not with money. As a consequence, the greatest barrier to health care in this country is not money prices, it's non-price barriers. And what do I mean by non-price barriers to care? I mean, how long does it take you on the telephone to get someone in a doctor's office to give you an appointment with a doctor? And then how many days do you have to wait before you get to see that doctor? And then how long does it take to get from your home to the doctor's office? And once you get there, how long does it take you to wait to see the doctor? There is lots of evidence that those kinds of non-price barriers are a lot more important than the price the doctor actually charges, even for people who are poor. Now in this country, we have 50 million people who are on food stamps. Most of you probably have never even seen food stamps. But 50 million people can walk into any supermarket that you and I can walk into. They can buy any product we can buy. They pay the same market price as we pay. When they go to the checkout stand, they plop down their food stamps and then they take cash out of their purse or out of their wallet and pay the extra amount they need to pay in order to purchase the, uh, the items that they want to purchase. If we could do that in healthcare, we wouldn't have an access problem, but we can't. 50 million people in this country are on Medicaid and mainly they're the same people who are on food stamps. The single biggest problem people in Medicaid have is they cannot find doctors who will see them. A woman in Massachusetts told me that she went down a list of 20 names before she saw, found a doctor who would see her. I said, were you going down the yellow pages? She said, no, I was going down the list that Medicaid gave me. Uh, at the same time that these people cannot find uh, uh, doctors who will see them, what do they do? They go to the community health centers where they wait for hours, or they go to the emergency rooms of safety net hospitals, like Parkland Hospital in Dallas where the average wait times are four, five, six hours, depending upon the day. Meanwhile, we've got a thousand walk-in clinics in CVS pharmacies and shopping malls across the country, and half of them are called minute clinics, just a signal to you that they know that your time is as valuable as your money, and the care is accessible, and it is high quality, and it is, is relatively inexpensive. And yet, the Medicaid patient, and by and large, Medicare patients are in the same boat, cannot go into these uh, clinics 
because they cannot top up and pay the extra money to pay the market price the way they can with their food stamps in the supermarket. In Dallas, Texas, if you have a sore throat or you have an earache, you'd pay about $75 at the Minute Clinic. Uh, Medicaid, however, only pays about $35. Now, if you want care to be accessible, then the uh, Medicaid enrollee has to be able to fork over another $40 and, and pay the market price. We don't allow that. Not only do we not allow it, we make it illegal. It's not only illegal, it's actually criminal. If the nurse at the Minute Clinic takes money from the Medicaid patient, she could go to prison. Now, what's wrong with this story? If we want to reform the health care system, we need to start by liberating patients. And then we need to liberate doctors. Doctors are the only professionals in our society who cannot repackage and reprice their services when demand changes and technology changes. They are slaves to a payment system that starts with Medicare and then is copied by all the insurance companies, by all the uh, employers. If you want to know why you can't talk to your doctor on the telephone about your health condition, it's because if you go down the list of 7,500 tests that Medicare pays for, effectively the telephone is just not on that list. If you want to know why your doctor is not emailing you the way your lawyer or your accountant uh, or architect would email you, it's because email is not on the list. And there's something else that's not on the list. It's social work. You know, Jeffrey Brenner is a doctor in Camden, New Jersey, and he was going through the hospital records, and he discovered that 1% of all the people living in Camden were, were generating 30% of all the costs at the hospital there. So he picked out one of the worst patients. This man was, uh, weighed over 600 pounds. Uh, he was a diabetic. He was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. He spent half the year in the hospital and the other half the year abusing his body. So Brenner takes this man under his wings and he gets him enrolled in AA and he gets him off drug, he, drugs and gets him off alcohol and he finds out he's religious, he gets him to go to church and uh, he gets him to take the drugs he's supposed to be taking and all of a sudden this man's medical costs went down, down, down. So then Brenner discovered other patients with similar problems and he found that just by changing the, their lifestyle, which really is what I call social work, uh, he is able to save Medicare and Medicaid millions of dollars every year. Now, how much do you think Medicare pays Dr. Brenner for saving it millions of dollars? The answer is zero. How much do you think Medicaid pays Brenner for saving it millions of dollars? The answer is zero. What I said at my blog is that we need to allow Jeffrey Brenner to become a millionaire. We need to say to Jeffrey Brenner, every time you save the taxpayer a dollar, we want you to have 25 cents. And then we need to tell every other doctor in the United States what we've done. And we need to say to them, you know, if you can find a way of lowering costs and raising quality, we will pay you in a different way. We don't need Washington, I respect the work that Elliot does, but, but we don't need Washington to tell doctors how to organize and, and practice medicine. We need the doctors who are there on the ground, we need their creativity, their innovative ability, their intelligence uh, to tell the government how we can lower costs and raise quality and then reward them for doing so. So number one, we need to liberate patients. Number two, we need to liberate doctors. And number three, we need to liberate the entrepreneurs. People often ask me, can markets work in healthcare? And the answer is that wherever you look in healthcare, markets are about the only things that are working. And what I mean by market is a place where the third party payers aren't. And by third party payers, I mean employers, insurance companies, and government. Wherever people are paying with their own money, healthcare markets work well. In cosmetic surgery, you get package prices, transparent prices. We've had a four or 500% uh, increase in procedures over the last uh, decade and a half. Uh, and, and we've had all kinds of technological changes of the type we're told increase costs everywhere else. And yet over the last uh, decade and a half, the real price of cosmetic surgery has gone down, even as the real price of every other surgery has gone up. For LASIK surgery, uh, again, you have package prices, you have price competition, quality competition, all kinds of technological change, and over the last 10 years, the real price has come down by 25%. I've already mentioned all the walk-in clinics. Uh, Rx.com was created to compete with local pharmacies. It's mail-order pharmacy. Again, just for patients spending their own money. Teladoc of Dallas has two million people that pay it uh, a monthly fee so they can talk by phone to doctors. So there really are telephone uh, consultations. It's just outside the third party payer system. 
and then we have an international market where every kind of elective surgery uh, uh, is, is, is priced. You can get, get package prices. You have hospitals in India and Singapore and Thailand that not only compete on price but also on quality, and they post at their website their quality data, and they say, here's our mortality rate, and here's our infection rate, and here's our readmission rate, and here's what it is the Cleveland Clinic, and here's what it is the Mayo Clinic. So that kind of quality competition is possible if you have price competition. And we actually have it in the United States now, although nobody talks about it. Canadians who can't get a knee replacement in Canada are coming to this country, and they are paying half as much as you and I and Blue Cross pays for the same procedure. The rule is they've got to be able to travel, and they've got to be able to pay cash up front. So markets do work, they can work, we need to allow them to do a lot more than they're now doing. So if you're really, really serious about changing the healthcare system, you need to liberate the patient, the doctor, and the entrepreneur, and that's a serious change. Okay, thank you. Dr. Harris. Well, good afternoon or evening it may be at this point. First of all, if I could just say it is a pleasure to be here in New Hampshire. This is my uh, first time, and I know that we in the South are known for our Southern hospitality, but let me just say, when I got to the airport last night, I was greeted with what I think is Southern hospitality. I think, what was the movie, was it, uh, I can't think of the movie words, you got me at hello? <laughs> well, you, you got me at the warm car because the rental car folks had uh, turned on the car and turned on the heat, and so that was, uh, that was great for me. I also want to take a, a, a point of personal privilege and introduce uh, two folks in the audience, and they are on the uh, AMA board with me, and they are your neighbors, and that is uh, Dr. Georgia Tuttle and Dr. Joe Anderson, so they are here to support me this evening, and I, and I thank them very much. I'm going to speak tonight probably wearing two hats. Uh, one is my AMA hat. Um, you know, we are the nation's oldest uh, physician organization. We have a long and storied history of serving our mission, which is to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. But also, as Ellen mentioned, I am the director of health services, public health services in Fulton County, major urban area, home to the city of Atlanta. And so I will be talking to you a bit tonight about probably putting what uh, my two colleagues, putting some of what my two colleagues talked about tonight into practice. Because I think we all agree that our current system is unsustainable. We've known that and there's been agreement on that for several years, many years prior to the Affordable Care Act. Perhaps the Affordable Care, Care Act stirred us um, into uh, more quickly uh, looking at how things can be changed, but clearly we've all recognized that um, our current system was uh, unsustainable. And I think this conversation that we're having tonight, along with you, because you all are part of the conversation, is how we're going to get to what I call a uniquely American solution. You know, we often uh, times compare ourselves to what other countries do, and we should, because we, we should learn uh, what others are doing, but I think we are going to have to come up with a solution that's uni uniquely American that will probably have bits and pieces of what we all uh, up here uh, are talking about tonight and, and, and certainly what um, you and the audience might have to say. I think all of us at one time or another are going to be a patient, um, hopefully maybe a, a healthier patient or a sicker patient, hope not, but all be a patient and service. It's really going to take that dialogue to get us to what I call a uniquely um, American system. Our American healthcare system should function better, but we all know, as has been pointed out, that we have a fragmented system um, that results in uncoordinated care, frustrated patients, frustrated doctors, higher cost, a lot of wasted administrative dollars, and lost opportunities for improvement. I think Ellen mentioned we spend 2.6 trillion and still have 50 million people uninsured. We have many more who are underinsured, and certainly we do not get the benefits that would be expected of an advanced uh, nation. Well, why? Why do we spend so little and get so much? Several things. My, my colleagues have pointed out some tonight. One is the a huge amount of underinsured and underinsured who do go to the emergency rooms and do get care that is higher cost care. We um, in Atlanta have Grady Hospital, huge urban center, a lot of folks go to Grady and sit for hours. Some leave, some stay, get the care, much more expensive care than going to the FQHCs. And while I do believe you and that, that there are probably long waits in some of the community mental health centers, 
Um, there are some community health centers that are available and the waits are not so long. And certainly going there is much uh, less expensive and do believe folks would get higher quality of care going to some of those community health centers. But we know there are barriers to get the folks there. One is it's not free. Um, of course, when I, I hear folks talk about it being free at Grady, we all know that, that it's not really free. It's just who's uh, paying the bill uh, at the point of, of service. We've also uh, talked about transparency or the lack of transparency in costs in our healthcare system. And I agree with my colleagues up here that is an issue that we need to overcome. The ability to communicate with one another. Again, we are fragmented and in silos. And um, if I want to talk to another system, I have to worry uh, about HIPAA violations. I uh, have to worry about uh, violating rules of the Federal Trade Commission. So we have a system right now that does not promote uh, transparency and does not um, promote our ability to communicate uh, with one another. I will say that uh, the adoption of health information technology is slowly changing our system, but we're still struggling to learn to communicate uh, within and among the many, the many stakeholders. Certainly the ACA has stirred progress in that area, and I can say the AMA is continuously, continuously working and aggressively working with regulators to ensure that the laws that are implemented, again, don't put more administrative and financial barriers um, in front of physicians and other providers and, and other systems. Integration. We have to continue to work toward integration of our healthcare system. Currently, we are mostly a series of silos, which often work at cross purposes. You, you mentioned that earlier, and often what duplicate services. Again, we have a $2.6 million hodgepodge of more than 5,000 hospitals and hospital systems, more than 100 academic medical centers with 900,000 physicians, uh, many of which are in small group or solo practices. And we really have to shift to working together as a system and not a series of silos to provide efficient and high quality care. John, you mentioned physicians um, not being willing to accept Medicaid and Medicare. That is a huge issue. Um, you also mentioned that uh, doctors get paid ridiculous salaries. We, 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 we might have to <laughs> agree to, uh, to, 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 to disagree on that. <laughs> Certainly not crying I'm poor. I'm not complaining you know, about that. that. <laughs> I understand they get a lot of money, so I, I do disagree with Okay. <laughs> Certainly not uh, crying poor, but um, doctors cannot keep the lights on uh, in some instances with what Medicaid and Medicare uh, pays. You know that I am a psychiatrist. You may not know that I'm a child psychiatrist. Um, in Atlanta, a child psychiatry is a huge shortage specialty. Probably don't have to tell you that. In Atlanta, many of my child psychiatry colleagues will not accept Medicaid patients, not because they don't want to be a part of the safety net, but because they simply cannot afford to keep the lights on, give the care that they desire to um, with the current uh, Medicaid payment system. And so, we have to continuously work to look at, uh, look at payment form and delivery reform. The AMA is excited about the promise of new delivery systems, ACLs, bundle payments, the medical home. And we really are optimistic about uh, the potential outcomes of some of these new delivery um, and payment models. Uh, the AMA supports uh, private contracting. I think that would be consistent, uh, John, with some of your views. Because again, as you said, Elliot, th there's no magic bullet. And there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all system again in, in our uniquely American system. I have two minutes left. I, I do want to say we need to also uh, sort of move from a more treatment focus to more prevention focus on public health. And so I have to say a word about that, and I'd be happy to talk more uh, about that in the question and answer period. John, you mentioned something key in your example about, I think they call that gentleman million dollars. Is that the case? He was a million dollar uh, Harry, or I can't think of, uh, uh, of his name. The social determinants of health. We have to broaden how we look at health care. It is not just about are you taking your medications? Are you um, eating correctly? But it is about what we call in Atlanta, uh, where we, what we're working on in Atlanta, and folks call the social determinants of health. 
Uh, I talk about an example where it's easy for me to say to my patient, you need to exercise. And I know you don't have a lot of money, so walk around your neighborhood. But if their neighborhood is unsafe, if there is not well-lit sidewalks, they uh, don't have that opportunity to do something as simple as walking around the block. If I tell my patients to eat healthier and they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, it is very difficult then for them to uh, watch their diet and watch their weight. So the social determinants of health is key, important, again, as we look to uh, ways of delivering health care differently in the, uh, in the future. Uh, you talked about, uh, you didn't say this, but uh, comparative effectiveness research. We do need the data. I do need to know, doctors want to know, actually, of these two interventions, where is the data? What does the data show about which one is better for, for my patient? Now, we don't support cookbook medicine. Uh, we realize that when the patient is in front of us, it's an N of one. The human body is very complex. So we're okay with, with, with data, we're okay with outcomes to guide us, but we really uh, want to maintain the sanctity of the, uh, that doctor-patient relationship. So I'll wrap up uh, there and uh, answer uh, questions at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you very much. What I'd like to do, Dr. Harris, if you don't mind speaking some more, uh, we'll reverse it. And, um, and I hope you'll forgive me, I'm gonna push you a little bit because I wanna draw out the interesting sort of contrast that each of you sort of brings. There's a tension about what you're saying. So I'm gonna push you a little bit on some of the things that you talked about, um, and this is on reconciling the two hats that you wear that, that seem a bit different. So, you know, sitting in the audience today, I think it's fair to say there are several or many aspiring physicians. I'm pretty sure that if I polled them, they wouldn't say, oh, I'm signing up for eight to 10 years of postgraduate medical education and training because I want to make a lot of money. That's, right. There's certainly other ways to do that. Right. At the same time, according to the Medical Group Management Association, physicians practicing primary care receive median annual compensation of about $202,000. Uh, specialists report median annual compensation of about $357,000 in 2010. So wait, I think folks are, are probably not too worried, are they able to put food on the table for their families? These are, um, you know, and as an economist, I understand opportunity costs, and, and I want highly trained people. But I do think it is an interesting juxtaposition when, and, and maybe this is unfair to the AMA because this is where the media focus is, but that the most vocal and strongest advocacy seems to be protecting physician incomes. Um, and, and sort of juxtaposing that with your speech, which was so eloquent about the social determinants of health, I'm kind of saying, well, okay, so if we paid them $400,000, would that help people have safe neighborhoods? Would that help? How would this help? And, and I know that you must get this question, but I would love for you to speak for two to three minutes on it. And then I would invite, if Elliot or John, you want to follow up with something brief, you know, a minute or so, that would be wonderful. Uh, absolutely, Ellen. And I, we, we talked about this question when we uh, met to discuss the forum. And I, when you first asked me the question, it didn't dawn on me that there was this tension. <laughs> Uh, but I, because I'm sort of in it every day, and I see the the work that the AMA does on issues other than payment reform, mm -hmm. and I think you hit the nail on the head. The issues that rise to the level of media attention, and the issues that are debated, uh, you know, in, in in Congress, have to do with physician payment, mm -hmm. and that's okay. And we have to be vocal as the AMA in protecting, in, in looking at that and protecting uh, payments to physicians and making sure that it's fair and equitable. But it, the AMA is so much more than that. And I, I just want the audience to know that I, this is not, uh, I don't want to give a rah-rah speech about the AMA, but to know that the AMA fo focuses a lot on public health. As a public health physi uh, physician, um, I learn so much when I come to the AMA meetings, policy regarding tobacco, obesity, uh, wearing bicycle helmets. I mean, I, I, you know, we have this huge policy compendium of so much more than just advocacy for uh, physicians' pocketbooks. So I'll leave it at that. And mm -hmm. so it, it's really not a tension. It's mm -hmm. the AMA is a big tent, a big umbrella. It is our responsibility to advocate 
uh, for payment reform, for new delivery systems, and for public health. Mm -hmm. So it really, AMA is more than just uh, advocating for protecting physicians' pocketbooks. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you know, I wrote uh, a short book about the history of the American Medical Association, and um, I've got to tell you, for 160 years, the primary goal of the AMA was to run a cartel for physicians and maximize their incomes, and that was more important than anything else the, the AMA did. And there was a time in the 1950s and 1960s when a doctor could lose his license to practice or lose hospital privileges if, if he advertised, if he didn't go along with fee schedules, if he, if he said that you know, he was more competent or better quality than a competing doctor. So, so this, this was like a medieval guild. Uh, I must say, though, that with respect to the most recent uh, accountable, uh, Affordable Care Act, the uh, Obama, what some people call Obamacare, I think the AMA uh, sold out its members. And doctors are not going to make more money, certainly not under Medicare. Uh, in fact, the chief actuary of Medicare says that in just eight years, Medicare fees to doctors are going to be lower than Medicaid fees. And uh, it's surprising to me that the AMA went along with it. Uh, some speculate that the reason for that is that the AMA makes more money from the monopoly it has over the payment uh, codes than dues from doctors. But whatever the reason, it did not represent doctors well in that legislation. I'm going to respond to that, but let me let Elliot. <laughs> let Elliot stop it. Well, I think there's a story in the. You know, I, I agree with both of my colleagues that you know we really have to get the market right, and that will free up ways of figuring out what the right price is for a physician. I mean, so that I think that the, if you look at some of the emerging um, models, whether it's in the safety net, you know, the, the accountable care organizations that are emerging in Minneapolis, in Colorado, in Oregon. Um, where, where use the current payment system as it is. The fee sort of is how, is how the money starts to flow. Um, but the tar there's a target budget set. Those physician groups and the hospitals with whom they partner um, can have a, know what they're supposed to do compared to that target. They have to improve care. If they improve care and reduce costs, they get, this is the entrepreneur at work, they get to share in the savings. And we're seeing lots of entrepreneurial activity, whether it's you know, on the information system side, on the, on the payer side, on the provider side, lots of innovative models, new primary care models where you can, you know, where you can reach your doctor at any time you want, um, where there are after hours, you know, after hours urgent care if you need to be seen, there are letters to the patient. So I think the, the, the whole purpose of what Dr. McClellan and I did, one of your good colleagues from Texas, I know, a good Republican, was to try to figure out um, how, we could, how we could make the market work in healthcare. A market where the market for cell phones works great if you're trying to buy an MRI or a knee replacement. It will not work well for people with serious chronic illness that's going to persist over years. At least I don't see that happening yet. Um, the other thing that happens in these markets, and this gets to the physician income issue, is that as soon as you start to create a market for the kinds of services that patients really want and delivery systems that are well organized, what we're seeing is that primary care salaries are going up um, and specialists are getting nervous about what the right salary is. I will note that it was just 25 years ago here at Dartmouth that this particular medical group, neurosurgeons were paid the same as primary care physicians. So people came to work because they wanted to be doing a great job as a neurosurgeon, it was fun to do the work, they all agreed to collaborate to take great care of their patients. It was only when hospitals started to compete to have orthopedic surgeons doing unnecessary procedures that the market for orthopedic surgeons went through the roof. Um, and that's why prices are so high for, for certain specialty services. So if we can get the market to work, we'll have entrepreneurial activity unleashed. Most of the activity that we're seeing is not in the government sector. It's in the private sector with the private payers. Um, I, there are all sorts of regulations at the state level that we have to get rid of so we can allow other providers to come in and, and augment physicians and, and get rid of the guild problem. Um, but the notion of redesigning care rather than rationing for high cost folks um, is what we really need to focus on. And you need to have the last word, Dr. Hips. <laughs> so I respect John's uh, interpretation of the uh, history of the A, and uh, we, we may just uh, d disagree on, on, on uh, interpretations and allow us all to have uh, different interpretations, but Ellen, if, 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 if what John says is correct, clearly the AMA does not uh, care about that's dollars. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> and I, I, I say that certainly, certainly uh, joking. Um, 
The Affordable Care Act um, was not a perfect uh, piece of legislation, as no piece of legislation that I know of. And I used to be a lobbyist, for some of you may not know that history, in Georgia for a while. And so I really understand slogging it and down and dirty in the, in the midst of a session. Not a perfect bill, but uh, consistent with a lot of policies of the American uh, Medical Association. Our support for the uninsured was huge, getting uh, 30 some, 40 some million uh, Americans insured was critical. A lot of the insurance reform uh, in the ACA consistent with AMA policy. So, so, so that is, is the reason. And the AMA, it, it's, this is just the beginning. And the AMA believes uh, that there will be opportunity, and there is, for payment delivery reform in all of these new models. Thank you. Dr. Goodman, I'd like to push you a little bit on some of what you're saying. <laughs> um, I have to, you know, equal opportunity pushing here. Um, I want to follow up on, there's not time to follow up on all the ideas, so, you know, I'm just going to choose one, and I want to follow up on this notion of liberating the patients. You know, on your blog, you frequently talk about, um, you know, the fact that in insurance, first dollar coverage doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, there's a lot of discussions of high deductible health plans and cons or consumer driven health plans as they're often called. So these plans, which one way to define them would be plans with uh, more than $1,000 deductibles for single coverage are growing quite rapidly. I don't think folks realize how rapidly. In just five years, from 2006 to 2011, uh, we moved from having 10% of covered workers with these plans to 31%, so almost a third of covered uh, workers in some kind of high deductible health plan. Now, these plans can typically be paired with something like a health savings account or health reimbursement arrangement, which is an account that they can use for you know, these services that fall under the deductible, co-payments, co-insurance, or, or services that are still under the deductible. Um, you know, some early reports suggest savings of as much as 15 to 30 percent when employers have moved to these health plans compared to others. That makes them look quite uh, attractive. But given the focus of today's panel and, and talking about sort of holes in the safety net and vulnerable populations, I want to push you in light of evidence on cost sharing and consumers. And I have the feeling that you and I could read the same paper and interpret it differently in the evidence. But let me just highlight a couple of examples. You know, the, the most famous one, the historical one, is the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. And, you know, what most people remember, rightly, because this was the main finding, was that, you know, on average, People, when they faced more cost sharing in these experimental plans, they were sort of randomized into different levels of uh, health insurance generosity. When they had more cost sharing, they consumed a lot less in terms of medical care. And on average, that really did not affect health in any measurable way. There were exceptions to that. So more vulnerable populations, low income, high risk, high blood pressure um, groups tended to have worse blood pressure outcomes, and there was even some suggestion of higher mortality. Now, that data are, you know, those data are old, but there are some, you know, some studies from more recent times, you know, some of the best evidence comes from things like evidence on tiered formularies and moving folks into tiered formularies. They don't show any difference in facing the costs of branded medication for acid reflux compared to medication that lowers cholesterol and might prevent heart attack. They just reduce all of it, um, which, you know, may have folks, the, the health implications of those two moves are, are, are quite different. Um, and related evidence in a study by Amitabh Chandra and others that was published in the American Economic Review recently, they looked at putting retirees into um, it, Cal California public workers and their retirees and their supplemental coverage. They change the cost sharing, so the increased cost sharing on the prescription drugs, as well as increasing co-payments for outpatient visits. Well, it did reduce the use of drugs. It did <laughs> reduce the use of outpatient visits, mm -hmm. and unlike RAND, they found an offset. It increased hospitalization for these folks. And interestingly, the hospitalizations were paid for by Medicare, while the, uh, <laughs> the drugs and the outpatient care were paid for by the supplemental plan. So I guess all of that is a, a somewhat long-winded way of saying, you know, how would you propose to protect populations that may be most vulnerable to any unintended consequences? Well, we have a dysfunctional system in which none of you ever sees a real price for anything. You can't even find out the price for most things before you get the procedure you're going to get. Um, and because, the, uh, because you're not paying money, uh, the providers aren't competing on price, 
And when they don't compete on price, they don't compete on quality either. So into this complex dysfunctional system, uh, we introduce the idea of allowing patients to control more of their own health care dollars. And uh, a mistake a lot of people made, uh, and I probably contributed to it in the early years, was thinking that, uh, that the major change that's going to uh, promote is a change in patient behavior. Now, it is true that when patients are spending their own money, they waste less of it, and they buy fewer things, and the RAND studies confirm. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll spend 30% less on health care, and it won't have any adverse effect on their health. Um, but um, the really important changes that occur occur not on the demand side of the market. After all, if you're spending your own money as a patient, there are only a couple of decisions you can make. You either buy, or you buy this, or you buy that, or you don't buy at all. Uh, uh, that's about it from the patient point of view. The really radical changes all occur on the supply side. When providers have to compete for patients spending their own money. You never have a problem with transparency. You don't have to pass any laws. You know, the, the, you walk in the Mena Clinic, you, they're going to tell you exactly what you're going to pay. Um, when you have price competition, you have quality competition. Um, a, a lot of those innovative things that I described that were going on utilized uh, electronic medical records. We keep he hearing, you know, why do so few doctors you have electronic medical records? Well, the Mena Clinics have had them for 10 years. Uh, concierge uh, doctors have them. So, so the real changes, uh, the really important changes that are brought about when patients control the money are on the supply side of the market. Now I just say, you know, um, that's right, cell phones are not like bodies. But I'll just tell you that I don't know very much about my cell phone. And AT&T is just as capable of running unnecessary tests as a doctor is, right? But what happens in this market is if I think they're, they're unnecessarily spending my money, I'm going to be angry and I'm going to go to some other provider and I'm going to tell my friends. And that's why this market works so well. Okay? We need to have the same thing in healthcare. Yeah. You know, I agree <laughs> that we need a good market in healthcare. Um, the, the limits we face are a couple. First is, I, I think we really are nowhere near um, the, as good as we need to be at measure, at being able to tell people the value of the services they're receiving. So that what they're relying on is physicians' judgments about what services they should get. And we are very good um, at persuading our patients to get um, things that may not be aligned with their own preference. So this, the first problem is we need much better measures of value um, so that we can understand when you're getting a hip replacement, what are the trade-offs, and we need to figure out how to inform patients of those choices um, in ways that are not dominated by the, the, the provider themselves. So Dartmouth built its, a lot of its reputation around how we get informed patient choice. We're all with you on the need to judge value, that, that the patients making good choices is really important. But right now, we've got to invest a lot more in the measurement so I can know whether that particular service is actually good for me or not. Um, the second problem is that the, as soon as you get to complex medical illness, um, the, the patient's um, financial incentives, um, they've gone past any you know, out-of-pocket spending limit, and they're going to gonna take whatever they get, and we need to figure out how to coordinate their care. So I think you're right. The, the creativity will come on the supply side. And where, you know, where Dr. McClellan and I and a bunch of others, the AMA was part of the, you know, a lot of our monthly phone calls to try to design this model, was you need to figure out how you can create competition around a package of services that will guarantee that where the, the providers can be creative about helping me figure out how to stay healthy, which drugs I should get for free, how to get good access to information. Because health is actually a little different than a, than a cell phone. So that for complex chronic illness, um, we need people to choose systems that will take great care of them, motivate those systems to figure out how to provide great care and provide transparency on the measures that lets them choose. And I think that's why we're seeing this movement toward a competitive market that, that you know, yes, with some rules, um, but we need much better measures of performance before we're gonna get to the point where I'm comfortable you know, letting every, everything be decided by a face-to-face -face encounter between a doc and, and the, the asymmetry of information. I think that's a term that you guys coined. I'm not an economist, but some of my, um, you know, is so great that, that patients are really hard-pressed to make wise choices currently. 
So I want to just, I'm, I'm going to shortchange you a me. little bit and give That's you a fine. shortened time or, or because we want to no, make absolutely. sure we leave time for audience questions. So I can give you a one word answer. You can give me a one word <laughs> answer. <laughs> so, you know, you've, you've spent a lot of time thinking about ACOs and how they should work. There were many, many challenges. Some of them you've just outlined. We don't do a great job of measuring quality. How do we f hold folks accountable if we can't measure quality? We don't know how to assign patients. There are very, you know, tremendous implications to assigning patients to ACOs or not assigning them. There are issues to how you pay folks for those patients and whether you get the risk adjustment right. And you know, as you and I know from working on looking at the, the physician group practice demonstration, these early results are somewhat disappointing on average because a lot of what happened is, you know, folks look sicker and savings that appear to be there, you know, don't, don't appear to be there when you do a better job of adjusting for the risk. And then of course, there's issues with, uh, you know, the flip side of integration is antitrust concerns. And we know that there are concerns that um, if, if ACOs and these organizations get too much market power, there will be, you know, not better quality, but higher prices, worse quality. So how, so how do you think it's going to work? <laughs> so, well, I think it was Niels Bohr who said prediction is really tough, especially about the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to learn, and that will be my one-word answer. What, what, I, what I, you know, I think the principles are fairly clear. Um, there's lots of progress being made on how, how, um, how we can evaluate in a really timely fashion the old way of evaluation where you wait five or ten years and then tell us it didn't work. Um, is not a useful model to help us try to get at this time of crisis when we can't afford, when we have 50 million people who are uninsured, the costs are going up. So I think the one answer, one word answer, learn. You know, I, I don't mind an experiment with accountable care organizations. I think we have, should have that. What, what I don't like is an administration that ignores Jeffrey Brenner, who's already, we know he's saving millions of dollars uh, for the federal government, and they're not giving him one dime for doing it. And uh, Brenner is sitting there, the only way he's surviving is with gifts from private foundations. And uh, it ought to be easy for Brenner to go to the federal government and say, you know, give me 25 cents on the dollar. Uh, but they won't do it because they insist that he practice medicine the way they've already decided it should be practiced. So Brenner actually is trying to become an accountable care organization. But here's the thing, I told you he's keeping people out of the hospital. But a real accountable care organization, full blown, takes care of the hospital care too. So they, they're going to want him to, 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 to handle the hospital side, which is not what he does. And then they're going to say, where are your electronic medical records? Well, suppose he doesn't have any electronic medical records. We, see, the, the whole problem here is we're going to force on people who are already doing a lot of good things, a lot of other things that they don't know how to do, instead of allowing people to do what they've already learned to do. And it's Dartmouth studies, you know, it's from you guys that I learned that if everybody in America goes to Mayo Clinic, we would lower our healthcare costs by a fourth, I think it was. So if everybody went to Intermountain, we'd lower it by a third. But everybody can't go there. They're gonna go other places. But we, one thing we can at least do is pay the, the ones that are doing the right thing extra dollars for doing the right thing and encourage everybody else to innovate as well in, in the best way they can, not in some way that, that somebody has designed back in Washington. Co-designed with the states. <laughs> And with the delivery systems, right. and, and incentivizing, and incentivized um, to create to foster the creativity. So I'll, we we can agree to disagree on how much is too much definition of what you sh you know who should be eligible. Um, Jeff's will be eligible, I'm sure. You know many others. You know there are a whole bunch he's, of physician he's organizations. Medicaid in the state of New Jersey, by the way, to have accountable care yeah. for the Medicaid population. There. So it, it, it's an experiment. It's an ongoing experiment. We don't really have the time not to do the experiment and not to learn while we're doing it. So with that, I would love to move to audience questions. Uh, as is always the tradition with events spon sponsored by the Rockefeller Center, I will give preference at first to students. And then if we feel that we've you know, had a few student uh, questions, then we will move to the community members. And I think we have folks with mics. So uh, there's a question right here. Oh, and if you could, if you could identify yourself and let us know, is this addressed to the whole panel or a specific panel member? 
Okay, hi, my name is Alexander Lopez. I'm a current freshman here at Dartmouth. Um, this question is specifically for Dr. Harris, but for the whole panel as a whole. Um, I'm actually an Atlanta resident, so I am from Georgia, and I'm, I'm very familiar with Grady Hospital. And I guess my question is particularly with regard to adequate facilities. Um, when I was in high school, I had um, a friend who was involved in a really horrific car accident, and um, from the waist down, her bones were completely shattered. And um, the Grady ICU unit um, was completely booked full, so the only, there was only two intensive care units in the state of Georgia that could handle her specific condition, the Grady unit and the Gwinnett um, Medical Hospital. So she was being constantly helicoptered back and forth between the two, incurring like unnecessary costs on her family. And I don't want to denigrate either of those hospitals, because I've had many grandparents who have gone through and had amazing experiences. but. I guess my question is, what is being done to make sure there's adequate health care facilities um, in like, the overall Georgia spectrum, like not just two locations to handle one particular case? And I know this happens in a lot of states, like in Berkeley, California, with the um, increased homeless population. And also, I kind of have a part to this question. Sorry, it's kind of long. Um, I had the unique chance to work with the United Way of Metropolitan Atlanta in a specific regard to the sheltering arms. And one of the things when I would work with the children, um, they were co constantly chronically ill, and they would constantly come in and have cold and flu symptoms that would eventually develop and would spread to the other children. And so I guess um, my question is, is there anything being done to have more preventative um, care for children with um, particular regard? Because one of the big problems was that their families had no um, adequate health care, and so when the other children were infected, you know, it would be kind of like a reoccurring cycle. So yeah, sorry, I know that's like a lot to throw you guys. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. I'm thinking, I, I just wonder about the level one uh, trauma, uh, if that's part of, uh, of the question, uh, of your, the first part of your question. Uh, Grady used to be the only level one trauma uh, center in the metro area, but just recently, I think maybe a year or two ago, there, there's another one, Atlanta Medical Center is now, so, so we have two. Um, it, you know, I live in Fulton County in the metro region. Actually, there's a wealth of hospitals there. Emory, Northside, great facilities there. So it, it may be an issue of uh, the level one trauma uh, center. And it is, it's, a hard, it's a high bar to be a level one trauma center, but we do have two in the metro um, area now. Now, I have to say I'm lucky to live in the metro area. Um, in the rural Georgia, there is a problem um, with access to hospitals and level one trauma center. And the state of Georgia has taken that on uh, to some degree. You know, it's been a it's tough time for states. Georgia is no exception uh, with funding. But over the last several years, um, there's been a move to increase funding as much as the Georgia General Assembly will for trauma in the state. So that it's been recognized um, as an issue. Your issue regarding uh, preventive care, and we are sort of talking about the safety net system, and, and I will tell you, I think there is a lack of appreciation overall about prevention. And uh, Elliot was telling me about a, a program um, uh, where folks are looking at how do we um, educate folks on the importance of a, a medical home, preventive care, not going to the ER. I think actually that's a huge culture shift. I don't wanna, I wanna take up a lot of time, but my father, I was born and raised in West Virginia. My father worked on the railroad, blue collar worker. My mom's a teacher. My father had health insurance all of his life. Good job in West Virginia. But you know what? My father, his parents did not. And so they went to the ER uh, because they didn't, never had the money for primary care. So they went to the ER. So there's this culture ingrained. So my father, even with having health insurance, actually, I have to talk him out of going to the ER still. So it's a cultural issue for, for some folks. And I think for folks who have not had health insurance, it's almost a rite of passage, at least in Atlanta, to go to the Grady. Go to the Grady's, they say. And so I think uh, we need to, to do some work on educating folks about the importance of prevention, particularly those that are more uh, prone to use uh, Grady or emergency rooms as primary care. I had something. Uh, the safety net hospitals like Grady are going to be devastated by Obamacare, all right? We're gonna insure 32 million additional people. Half of those are gonna be in Medicaid. The Medicaid pa patients disproportionately go to hospitals like that. If Massachusetts is the guideline, most of the others in subsidized health plans will also be paying little better than Medicaid rates. They won't find doctors who can see them. They will be in those emergency rooms. 
Meanwhile, the rest of the nation is going to be forced to have more generous care than they previously have. They're going to increase their demands from doctors, making it even more difficult for anybody who's in a plan that pays below market to see a, a private physician. So the flood of people going to these facilities is going to definitely increase. Their dispro money is going to be taken away from them, some of it is. And um, I have yet to talk to anybody who is associated with the Safety Net Hospital who, uh, who is optimistic about his future. If, I'm so, oh, go ahead, but I can, I'll, I'm actually, next. Actually, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad thing for uh, Grady to have less business. And, and I will tell you, you have why. More the, business. No, no, no. It, it, let, let's say when everyone has Medicaid, they will then be able to go to other hospitals other than Grady. That will save the Fulton County taxpayers. My, my county government, government pays $50 million to Grady in Atlanta. And those of you who don't know, I'm sorry. Fulton County and DeKalb County fund most of Grady, um, along with Medicaid. But we know they can't uh, you know, keep the lights on with Medicaid. So it will be a tax savings for the citizens of Fulton and DeKalb if everyone has insurance and can then go to the private, private hospital. So that's another way to, to look at that. It's, it's really important that we at least acknowledge uh, the possibility that the, price, the, the payments of Medicaid might be reasonable and the costs that, are, that everybody's built into their systems are unreasonable. So if you look at what Denver Health, a safety net hospital in Denver has achieved, they've taken advantage of what Toyota has taught its manufacturer, its manufacturing plants to do. They've, rigorously looked at all the waste in the system, rigorously taking it out, and they're making money on their Medicaid patients. So every time a hospital executive or a physician says, oh, my costs are way over the prices they're paying me, I say, well, that's a choice. You're, you've built your, your cost structure the way you built it. If you think about really being efficient and radical redesign of practices, you know, you can, you can get lower costs. Second point. You know, one of the great, my favorite finding of 30 years of research on variations in spending and quality and access is that if you look at the places that, you know, we've, we've surveyed physicians to ask, so how hard is it to get in to see a physician or how, you know, how hard is it to get in to see a specialist? Um, the places that where it's most difficult are the places with the most specialists. So there's no relationship between the actual supply of physicians and the accessibility of services. It is about how we organize our practices. So when you move to reorganize practices where they, where they hey, they could use their cell phones um, to, 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 to If call only Medicare would pay for it. To call their physician. <laughs> Under an ACO, Medicare will pay for them to talk to their doctor. Right. The doctor gets reimbursed some way. So, so when you think about radical redesign of both the way we access primary care practices um, the way information is delivered to patients and thinking about our costs um, in ways that say, oh, maybe, maybe we actually could lower our per unit costs. Physicians could make, keep more of their incomes, lowering their unit costs, and patients will get better care. All right, let's, let's take another question. Uh, let's see, back there. Do we have somebody with a mic over on this side? Oh, yeah, there's the mic. Hi, my name is Amrita Sankar. I'm a 12. I'm a government major public policy minor. I actually had the distinct pleasure of taking Professor Mira's health policy reform class last year. Um, my question to all three of the candidate, uh, three of the panelists, thank you for being here, by the way. Uh, We're not running for office, I promise. You're not running for election or anything like last that. Last thing you nope. want. Uh, my question is concerning uh, a fourth element. All three of you have spoken to cost, quality, and accessibility. But as we've seen in regards to the current legislation being passed, there's also the component of uh, political controversy. I'd be curious to hear how the vitriol we're seeing in Washington, D.C. and the bipartisanship is contributing to the healthcare debate, especially with regards to ACA being considered unconstitutional. Well, you know, you, you can't reform major institutions one party at a time. And this is the mistake George W. Bush made with Social Security. He didn't have any Democrats with him. And I went out and tried to help him with Social Security. But if only Republicans are talking about it, it's not going to get done. Now, now the Democrats managed to get, get uh, enough votes to pass it with, without a single Republican helping. But look where they are now. You, the, the, the only one party has bought into it. The other party hasn't. And that's why it has a shaky future. So no matter what the Supreme Court rules, I mean, this law is not going to stay the way it is. It's got, got too many flaws in it anyway, but, but Republicans are, are going to want to change it. 
And uh, at some point, even the Democrats are going to say, look, we can't go forward with it the way it is. Okay, Republicans, what do you want? And so the direct answer to your question is you cannot reform major institutions without buy-in from both parties. So the AMA is ready, willing, and able to work with whomever wants to uh, advance uh, us to a healthier uh, nation and advance policies and legislations that are consistent with AMA policy. And so um, certainly we do live in a time where there is a lot of uh, partisanship, uh, but what we have to do is be ready to take advantage of and work with whomever wants to, uh, to work with us to improve the system. I would just add that, the, that, that Dr. McCullens, in my experience, was working with both parties um, around how we can get the market and incentives aligned to produce better care and lower costs. And when you come up with a good creative idea that both that is attractive, um, if it actually, say, under budget scoring things, if it actually is scored by CBO as saving money, both parties want to do it, I promise you, because then they get to spend money on something else, some bridge to nowhere or some plan to somewhere else. Um, so, so creative solutions, um, you know, are st I'm still hopeful about creative solutions, and if it gets thrown out, we'll, we'll, it's still going to proceed. The, a lot of these reforms are moving rapidly through the private sector um, and are going to move forward. Uh, and, you know, God help us if it all gets thrown out, that'll be really confusing. Um, but hard work by people in government and, you know, young people to, to develop new ideas will help us fix this. Great. Do we have other questions? Let's see. I saw a bunch of... I'm just looking for students before, but okay. <laughs> yes. Do we have a microphone over here? Thank you. Um, uh, this is for Mr. Goodman and, and uh, the other panelists as well. Are there problems that um, the marketplace is, does not do a good job at solving? Some people have suggested that um, you know, national defense is something that shouldn't be privatized. Some people have suggested that uh, delivery services um, should not be privatized. You know, FedEx doesn't deliver everywhere, and, uh, you know, the Postal Service is getting uh, sort of uh, whittled down so that citizens who live in one area may not get as good of access to delivery services uh, as others. And um, so using uh, national defense or, or access to infrastructure, whether it's... Uh, delivery systems or highways. Um, could health care be one of these sort of infrastructure or national interest sort of um, issues that uh, deserves other options or additional options besides uh, free markets? Yeah. Well, let me just keep, stick to health care. And um, is there a role for government? Yes. Um, we're not going to allow people to starve to death. That's why we have food stamps. We're not going to allow people to, uh, who are sick, uh, we're not going to put them out on the ice, um, which is why we have Medicaid. But the difference in those two programs is that we allow a market for food to exist and we allow poor people to be in the same market you and I are in. But in healthcare, we've got them segregated into an inferior healthcare system, and we don't have to do that. And so what I have proposed and what at the NCPA and uh, for years, this is the John McCain plan. Let's, let's give everybody in the country so many dollars for health insurance. And I think today we could afford $2,500 for an individual, $8,000 for a family. That's, that's the federal government pays for the first $8,000, okay? Any extra it comes out of your pocket. And, um, and, and then, let, then let the market work. So you, 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 you let, the government provides the subsidies but then you give people maximum freedom to solve the rest of the problems. It's probably all, all an argument about what the level of subsidy is that we might disagree on at various <coughs> ends of this, ends of this. I mean, and that's a lot of the argument about vouchers, you know, at what level are they set? Um, I do think there are, there are things like, there are public good aspects of healthcare, um, and that's why we have a public health system. There are things that healthcare deliver, that patients won't buy about public vaccination, about keeping the water clean, about 
you know, treating it, you know, infectious disease epidemics. So, so there is some public good aspect to many elements of healthcare. Uh, and then the arguments are about what are the gray areas and what counts really as a public good, what counts really as a, what should be treated as a private good. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. We need a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna. I'm a first year uh, medical student at the Geisel School. Um, my question, I think, is sort of a more you. philosophical one. Um, you used the analogy of food stamps and topping up as a, as, um, a way to pay for this um, system that you're proposing. And you also used the figure of $2,500 per every American citizen um, as an adequate number for you know, some level of baseline level of health care for everyone to receive. Um, but from my experience, um, People that receive food stamps usually don't have a lot of money to be topping up to buy additional things. And in addition, I know an echocardiogram alone at DHMC costs $3,000, beginning to end. So where does that put someone who may not be in the category that Dr. Fisher was talking about, where you're pretty healthy, you don't really require a lot of um, medical attention. It just seems that the math really wouldn't work for the people who really need it the most and that we really are most concerned about, the people who don't have health care, who are in um, the state of poverty that all of us you know, want to help lift them out of in this country. Thank you. Well, to address that, that, that very legitimate uh, issue, uh, I really do believe in a public sector alternative. Um, and I believe it should be Medicaid. And so I'm in favor of keeping Medicaid there, but as an option. Nobody has to be in it. It's a choice. And I would open Medicaid not just to poor people. I would open Medicaid to everybody. So if you want to take your $2,500 and pay it to Medicaid, you can be in that plan. But I also would allow everybody in Medicaid to get out of Medicaid and into an employer plan, into a private plan. So nobody is trapped in an inferior system. But if you like the system, you can join it. And if you think, if you think we need a system that pays almost every medical bill, it can stay there and be that system. Well, I would just like to thank our three panelists. I think um, if the discussion could be as lively and civil in Congress, we'd be a lot further than we are right now. But it's been tremendous fun and a great privilege. So thank you very much.